All right, it is six o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for Solar Oregon's How to Go Solar and Storage webinar. This is a recurring webinar that uh, we put on for home and business owners to learn about the technology and the whole process of going solar. So if that uh, you think that describes you, then you're in the right place. My name is Zach Snyder. I'm a program manager at Solar Oregon and uh, really excited to be here with you. Uh, this is our, uh, like I've delivered this a couple times every month for the past couple of years. We keep it updated. Um, and uh, this is a, a great uh, a webinar to join at because we just did our annual update. Uh, and so we have some new content that I'm really excited to share with you. So uh, know that you're getting the most up-to-date information that we've got on uh, solar and storage tonight. This is a roughly one hour webinar. We are going to walk through a few topics, uh, starting off with how the technology of solar works. Then we'll take a look at uh, what makes your home or business right for solar. And we're really thinking about the physical characteristics of your site. Then we'll take a look at battery storage, and that is a place uh, in particular where we have uh, a few new slides of extra content here tonight. Uh, then we're going to talk about the cost of solar, the incentives that are available. We'll walk through a couple of example budgets, and uh, that's usually exciting for folks. And then we'll talk about how to get started going solar, how to find a contractor, and the installation process. We are going to wrap up with a Q&A, which is always my favorite part of the presentation. Uh, and so I'm here to answer your questions about solar and storage. Uh, and so uh, I'll show you the Q&A function here in Zoom in a second, but uh, please think of any questions you have as we're going through this about the content or about solar in general, uh, and then we'll hit those at the end in the Q&A. First, a little bit about Solar Oregon. Uh, I've been with Solar Oregon for the past three, three and a half years, but we are a 43 year old organization. We're a nonprofit, and we've certainly changed a bit over those 43 years uh, as solar has changed. But our focus is on education, outreach, community building, and advocacy. This is one of our main programs, our How to Go Solar and Storage. Uh, you can always find us here and uh, update your information about solar. Uh, we host this virtually as well as in person in various places around the state. We also have solar tours, including a couple of large tours. The Go Zero Tour is a tour of zero energy homes that is both in person and virtual, uh, centered in Portland for the in-person, but we have sites usually across the state. It's always a lot of fun that's in October. We also have a solar winery tour, which this year is gonna be in July. And that's always fun as well. We also put on special showcase events and other special topic webinars and in-person events. We have a couple of events uh, that I would like to mention. You'll find all of these uh, on our Eventbrite or on our website, solaroregon.org. Uh, I'm going to drop some links into the chat, which I'll reference throughout the webinar, uh, but you can find uh, those links I just mentioned in there. Um, we have an event on February 4th, which is put on by a group of volunteer board members and uh, dedicated volunteers who are subject matter experts on uh, different various architectural energy concepts and um, this will be the third event, I believe, that they put on. Uh, we're calling that the Green Energy Series. That's on February 4th. So that's going to be this Saturday. Uh, and that's at 10 a.m. So definitely check that out. It's a free webinar. And then next Tuesday, we have a uh, in-person showcase of a multifamily uh, building that was uh, built by uh, Albertina Care, which is a nonprofit that focuses on folks with uh, intellectual and, and uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I will be there February 7th. Uh, that's in East Portland. That's also a free event. We'll have uh, some snacks from elephants. So uh, come say hi and check out what is going to be, I think, a really cool showcase there. 
We are a member-based nonprofit, so thanks to all of our members who uh, have supported us through the years. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one. Uh, and you can, of course, follow us uh, on our Eventbrite in particular, as well as uh, sign up for our newsletter or follow us on social media. Thank you to Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, Energy Trust is uh, supporting our How to Go Solar and Storage program and has for many years. Uh, and Energy Trust of Oregon is an independent nonprofit. They've been around uh, also for a number of years. Uh, they provide uh, incentives as well as fund other programming like this educational programming to uh, increase access to affordable and um, uh, efficient, in particular, energy, uh, as well as renewable energy. They serve the customers of Portland General Electric, Pacific Power, and the uh, investor owning uh, gas utilities. So uh, thank you to their support. A couple of housekeeping notes as we get started. We have a chat. Please feel free to use the chat. You'll also find the links that I put into the chat uh, up there. I might drop those at the end of the webinar too. Uh, we also have a Q&A button, and that is separate from the chat. So uh, if you don't see your menu, you might have to mouse over your screen, but when you see your menu, you'll see the Q&A, you click the Q&A, uh, you'll see a, a box open up and you can type your question in. That's how I'll be receiving all of our questions tonight. Uh, you can type in a question anytime during the webinar, and it will be saved for later during the Q&A, and I will answer it at that time. I am uh, going to launch also a couple of polls right now, and these are uh, things that we do to help me understand who I'm talking to right now uh, and to get feedback from you at the end of the event. So uh, really appreciate your uh, input here. This first question, you should see a box on your screen asking you where are you joining from, and uh, you can just click the option that seems most appropriate for you. All right, looks like we're mostly there. And I'm gonna go ahead and close out this poll. Uh, it looks as though we are largely uh, in the Willamette Valley, maybe uh, not just Portland, but uh, a little bit uh, outside of Portland too. Then we've got some folks from out of state. So welcome to everybody, thank you. Uh, I have another poll here, this is a, poll that is uh, anonymous uh, and optional, but it, we're, we just collect uh, demographics of our attendees uh, to figure out who we're reaching. So I appreciate your input there. All right, I'm just gonna give a couple more seconds here and then I will close this one out. Thank you to everybody. Uh, and then the last poll before we get started is two questions asking your familiarity with a couple of the incentives offered by Energy Trust of Oregon. And this is to help me get a gauge on um, if uh, you are familiar with these. All right, you guys are pretty quick. I'm just gonna give a couple more seconds. And I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll. Uh, it looks as though a couple people are familiar with some of these incentives, that's great. Uh, most of you are not. And so our goal by the end of the webinar, uh, one of our many goals is to make sure that you are. So thank you for indulging me. Let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, like I said, a couple of these uh, slides, these are the first times that they're being presented here. And so I'm excited to give this new information. Um, but some of it is also uh, content that you, uh, if you have attended our previous events, you might recognize. So first I wanna talk about 
what uh, is a solar system, what are the components that make it up, and how does it work? So here's a diagram that shows you these basic components. Uh, it's relatively simple. Let's start off with the solar panel uh, that is floating in midair up to the left of the house here. Uh, that panel obviously is going to be on the roof along with many other solar panels probably. Uh, it's called photovoltaic panel, but that's just another name for solar panel. The sunlight strikes that panel, it produces electricity, and it produces a certain type of electricity called DC electricity. Now your home and all of the circuits in it use something called AC electricity. You don't have to worry about the difference, but know that there is a difference and there is an additional component to your solar system called an inverter, or you might have several microinverters. They do the exact same thing. All they do is they convert that DC electricity into AC electricity so it can be used in the circuits in your home. From there, it gets wired into your home electrical panel. That is your breaker panel, most likely in your garage. And from there, the uh, electricity produced by your solar panels goes into all of the circuits in your home and helps to power everything, uh, your lights, your appliances, uh, even if you charge an electric vehicle, things like that. If you are producing more solar than you are consuming at any given moment, the excess solar energy flows out through your utility meter and back onto the electrical grid. Uh, and a note here that your utility meter is going to be swapped out when you get solar, solar with a special type of utility meter called a bi-directional meter. Your classic utility meter is just gonna record the electricity flowing into your home. But when you get solar, you need a meter that can uh, record the electricity going into it and out of your home. When the sky is dark and it's evening and you're using electricity, you're still going to be able to produce to pull electricity from the utility grid. And in that way, you will have uh, the ability to use both the solar and the grid, uh, which makes this a grid tied solar system, which is uh, the vast majority of solar systems that get installed. That's a basic overview. It's really simple. There are no moving parts, which is one of the reasons why solar is so easy to maintain. Let's take a look at the component that I mentioned that does the conversion from DC to AC electricity. On the left, we have an image of an inverter. That's that white box there. It happens to be on the outside of the home, though uh, it can also often be next to the electrical panel, and that's actually the best place for it. Um, on the right hand side, we have images, uh, an image of the underside of a, a solar system. This is a ground mounted system just so we can see underneath it, but it's going to be the, the exact same thing if it's on your roof. You see these black boxes here uh, that are going to be your microinverters and they're going to convert the electricity for one or two solar panels uh, for each of these microinverters. You might ask the question, what is the difference between inverters and microinverters? Uh, they're both great technologies, standard technologies. Uh, the, the difference is kind of nuanced and really your contractor, as they're designing your specific system, will have the best information about why you would choose one or the other. Uh, sometimes it has to do with uh, scale and cost and things like that, but these are both great technologies. Solar has two main ways in which it can be mounted. The vast majority of solar systems are mounted on the roof, and that is a great place for solar uh, because your roof is otherwise just sitting under the beating sun, uh, may as well produce some electricity with it. Uh, this is especially common in urban areas. When you get farther out of urban areas and you start to have more land on your property, uh, that's where you might encounter some ground mount uh, possibility. Uh, the picture on the right is of a ground mount, and that is where the solar is uh, mounted on racking that sits right on the ground. These are both great mounting options, uh, and they, uh, they can work for you if you have the ability for a ground mount. Uh, most, most people don't have the space for it. Uh, one other difference between a ground mount and a roof mount is that with ground mounts, you are going to have to trench a copper wire from the solar system back to your electrical panel on your property. The cost of the trenching and of the copper wire, because copper can be relatively expensive, uh, can increase the cost of the system relative to a roof mount somewhat. And so that's uh, one consideration for these mounting options. 
Now I'm going to uh, sidestep here for a second, and I'm going to go through a little bit of content. This is new content about solar roof tiles. I'm excited to be able to uh, tell you this. This uh, is a separate technology from what we're talking about tonight. This presentation is about standard solar panels, as you've been seeing in the images on the screen so far. Uh, there is another type of solar product called solar roof tiles. Uh, we get lots of questions about it, and this is why we've uh, put this in here. Um, the image here on the left, you can see the home. Uh, you don't see any solar panels on there. That's because the roof itself and the shingles themselves, uh, this is an Oregon home, uh, are producing the electricity from the sunlight. Um, this is a completely different technology than standard solar panels. The vast majority of solar that gets installed in Oregon is standard solar panels and not solar roof tiles. This is a newer technology. Uh, it has been around for a few years. It's been in other markets like California for a little bit longer, uh, but it's still, relatively speaking, it's a newer technology. It is being installed uh, very slowly in Oregon. Um, there have uh, been a lot of, um, you know, projections and claims about how quickly it's going to grow. Um, there's obviously a lot of excitement about solar roof tiles. Uh, I would say that uh, there are there have been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, predictions made about solar roof tiles in terms of when price will come down to make it price competitive uh, or more attractive to more homeowners. Um, it's still relatively more expensive. Um, and uh, like I said, it's a more complex technology. The installation pr process can be more complex. Uh, it's uncertain when uh, the price might come down to the point at which uh, most uh, more people will be interested in it. Um, it is currently an option in the Oregon market, uh, but I would say uh, regardless, you shouldn't wait if you're considering solar. You kind of know if you're interested in solar roof tiles. Uh, let me tell you uh, a couple of other specific things about them. Uh, the complexity of the technology means that uh, choosing an installer is, I would say, really important. And so uh, one of the questions I would focus on is uh, asking the, the companies, um, how many of these solar roofs have you installed? Uh, the, you will find that Typical solar installers will not install solar roofs as an option for you. You really have to go to the companies that are specifically doing that. That's either the company manufacturing them uh, or uh, other companies that they have partnered with and ha that have gone, gone through uh, a specific uh, training program with them to become a certified installation partner. Um, so that's about all I'm going to tell you about solar roof tiles, just to let you know. Uh, and... Uh, the, the vast majority of solar is not solar roof tiles, but that is another product on the market there. So let's talk about the excess energy that you are exporting back onto the grid, as I mentioned in the diagram showing how solar works. Those extra kilowatt hours of electricity that you export you can get credit for. And uh, this is through a system called net metering. And I'm going to describe basically how this works with these two graphs. The graph on the left uh, shows the amount for a typical sunny summer month of electricity you're producing with your solar in the orange bar, that's your solar electricity that month. The blue bar is how much electricity you consume that month. And the green arrow then is the difference between those. And that's what you will get your net metering credit for. Now, uh, you're gonna bank up those net metering credits in the sunny summer months. Let's move over to the graph on the right, which shows a typical cloudier winter month because that's typical in Oregon here. You'll see that the amount of electricity that your system is producing is predictably less than in the summer. Uh, and it's in this case, less than you are consuming in that typical winter month. The red arrow here shows you how much electricity you'll have to buy from the utility grid. The great thing about net metering is that you can use those credits you earn during the sunny summer months, uh, and those can be used to pay off the uh, offset what you would otherwise be purchasing from the grid in the cloudy winter months. A couple of things to note, uh, net metering year starts on April 1st, 
and not on January 1st. Uh, so you start to bank those credits in uh, April and you go through the sunny summer months there. Any excess credits that you do not use throughout the course of the year will be uh, lost to you at the end of the net metering year. So that's March 31st. This has a big implication for the sizing of your system, uh, which I'll talk about here in the next slide, but this is the basics of net metering. Sorry, not, not the next slide, following slide after this. Uh, here's what your net metering bill might look like. This is an example from a PGE customer who has solar. Uh, you can see the on the left here, um, the meter uh, period, the dates of the service period. There's the start date and the end date. And there's the uh, information about how much electricity at, uh, at the beginning and end of that period that is consumed by you, that's that net consumption. And then the excess generation is how much you pushed out onto the grid. So those are recorded separately and they're separate numbers. What you can see is that in this case, uh, the they are subtracted here. And so uh, this customer earned 327, it says negative 300, that's how much electricity you use, and negative 327 kilowatt hours here. So that's how much net metering credit they earned. Uh, your billable kilowatt hours in this case will be zero kilowatt hours, which means you're not paying for electricity that, that month. You may be uh, slightly surprised then to look over on the right and see that you're still paying a utility bill. Uh, in this case, it's going to be about 12 bucks. And the reason that there is a uh, still a charge each month is because there's a what's called a base charge for your utility. You can think of that as the money that goes into the maintenance and upkeep of the poles and wires of the grid itself. The uh, Additionally, there's uh, a couple of small taxes and fees which are uh, put as line items here. Uh, but this is much smaller than the typical uh, average Oregon monthly uh, electrical bill. And so the point here is that you're saving a lot of money on this monthly electrical bill. And that gets us to really one of the core benefits of solar, which is that this is a way to save money on your electricity costs. There is a, an upfront cost of solar. We'll talk about that later. Um, and there is a period during which your solar system is paying itself off, essentially. After that period, uh, you are getting access to essentially free electricity for the lifetime of the system. So. Uh, the last thing I'm going to touch about here uh, relative to the technology itself is the system size. So remember when I said that the net metering credits, while they roll over from month to month, they don't roll over from year to year. What that means is that you want your solar system to produce uh, as much, up to as much ele electricity you consume in an average year, but you don't want to exceed that. That's something that solar contractors are really good at doing. They'll predict how much uh, energy your system will produce, and they'll compare that with how much you typically use uh, based on your past electrical bills. Other factors that can affect your system size include available space of your roof. Maybe you have enough to offset part of your electrical consumption, but not all of it. Uh, that can still be a great uh, use case for solar. Maybe it's your budget. Maybe you have the roof space, but you want to install some solar panels uh, only in part of it. Uh, maybe you want to consider adding more solar later. I would definitely tell your contractor if that is something you're considering, because that might go into how they design your system. Uh, a final note here is that the average size system is plus or minus eight kilowatts. You don't have to worry about what a kilowatt is, uh, but we're going to reference that later in our uh, budget examples. And note that the system size for solar can vary dramatically. It can be uh, as small as even one and a half or two kilowatts up to uh, 15 plus kilowatts on a residential home is not uncommon. So big range there. That's the basics of the technology. Let's take a look at uh, the physical characteristics of your site that might make it easy or more difficult to go solar. Uh, I note that there's already six questions in the Q&A, which is great. I'm excited to get to those. Uh, I love seeing a strong Q&A already at this point. 
First, I want to talk about how much sunlight your property is receiving. So here's a hypothetical home, maybe some solar panels on it. Underneath it is the compass rose. You can see the cardinal directions, north and south. The arcs traveling over the home and these orange beach balls. These are the sun and this is the path of the sun in the summer and in the winter. Regardless, you can see that the path of the sun is in the southern sky, which means that south facing roofs are ideal for solar. However, east and west facing roofs can also work quite well for solar. The only roof planes that you don't see solar being installed on consistently are uh, northeast, north and northwest. Of course, you may have a perfect south facing roof, but if you have other beautiful objects like trees or buildings or uh, another feature nearby, a large rock maybe, that is shading part of your roof, uh, that can eat into some of your solar resource. However, it can be really hard to judge this with your own amateur eye. Uh, solar installers are really good at Taking a quick look on Google Maps, if you call one up, they'll ask your address, they'll just pop it into Google Maps, and they'll get a sense of uh, how much shading you likely have. Uh, they'll either be able to tell you, oh, it looks great, uh, or, oh, it looks like you're not really a candidate for solar, or it's somewhere in the middle, and we'll come out and uh, take a look in person and assess it. Another factor here is the geometry of your roof, the shape of it, and specifically how complex that shape is. The best case for solar, the simplest installation uh, case for solar is a nice flat contiguous plane of your roof. That's uh, what you see in the image on the right here. You have lots of area on this nice south facing roof plane where you can just stack the solar panels right next to each other. That makes for an, an easy install. Over on the roof on the left, you can see that there's lots of complex shapes to these roof planes. There's lots of area to the roof that's facing south, uh, but it's a little bit more broken up and some of it is slanted. And that can make it either more complex in terms of how the wiring and the racking are laid onto your roof, uh, or it might mean that some of these roof planes just can't support solar panels at all. And so you have a much reduced area for solar overall. Finally, and maybe most importantly about your roof itself is that your roof condition matters when you go solar. That's because when you have to re-roof, you can't really delay your re-roof. Uh, and when you re-roof and you have solar, you have to uninstall the solar system, do the re-roofing, and then reinstall the system. This is a service that your solar contractor uh, may provide. Uh, sometimes contractors uh, will, uh, it'll just take them a little bit longer um, if they've got a lot of other installations that are newer, uh, but it is a service that's provided. Um, it's for this reason that it's recommended that you have uh, at least 10 years and ideally 20 plus years of roof life left. Um, and uh, the, this is because the cost of that installation reinstallation service can be as much as $10,000. And so it's really something that you want to make sure it's toward the end of the useful lifetime of your system and not toward the beginning of it. Uh, if you have an old re roof, an old roof, uh, wait uh, until after you re roof. After you re roof, that's the perfect time to go solar. Uh, roofs have different lifespans. And so you may not know the lifespan of your current roof. Uh, but your solar contractor can either assess the condition of your roof, or uh, you could look it up based on uh, any documentation you have from when it was installed, maybe from a previous owner. Uh, composite shingle roofs, as pictured here in this image, uh, are they have typically a, a, a decent lifespan, but it's a little bit shorter than metal roofs. That being said, composite shingle and metal roofs are both great roofs for solar. But if you have a metal roof, especially a standing seam metal roof, you don't really have to worry about this as much, typically because uh, the lifetime is just a lot longer for metal roofs. One final note about the physical aspect of your home is that what's underneath your roof can also be important. Here's why. 
when your solar contractor goes to get the permits for your system after they've designed it, they'll go to the uh, local building department, uh, submit the plans, and they'll get an electrical permit, but they'll also get a structural permit. And getting the structural permit uh, can be easy in some jurisdictions outside of Portland. But in Portland, uh, there is uh, relatively strict rules about uh, the structural requirements for your home uh, if you're getting solar. And so this is particularly for uh, Portland homeowners um, and uh, not as relevant for folks outside of Portland, uh, but also particularly for urban craftsmen home types in Portland. Those are the ones that most experience, most often experience uh, an issue here. Uh, what might happen is that uh, your home either has trusses or rafters and uh, trusses is, is what you see on the image on the left here. There's these support beams. You might see these metal attachment pieces here. Uh, if your roof has trusses, if you pop your head in the attic and you see those cross beams, you should be a-okay for solar. And if, you're, if you have a newer home, uh, you'll almost certainly have trusses. On some older homes that have rafters, you can still get a permit in Portland, no problem. It depends on how far your roof spans uh, horizontally. Um, your solar contractor may go up and take some measurements. Uh, if it's not within the uh, prescriptive uh, bounds of what's allowed by the, uh, the building code uh, department, they, the building code department might tell them they have to hire an engineer to take a look and run some calculations. The cost of the engineer uh, can be two to three thousand dollars, and so that can add some cost to your system. The engineer then could either come back and say this is fine and it passes uh, the building code department's specifications, or the engineer might come back and say uh, this doesn't pass and you're going to have to add reinforcements and they'll prescribe specific reinforcements. Those reinforcements are things that your solar contractor can get up in your attic and install, as long as there's enough uh, room to get up in there. Uh, but that can add an additional three to $7,000 for the installation. And so in the worst case, uh, it can increase the cost of solar uh, between that three to $10,000 uh, kind of range. That is the a look at the physical characteristics of your site and what makes it easy or less easy to install solar. Let's take a look at solar and storage. Uh, and this is, uh, we're talking about an, a new technology here called, or another technology we haven't mentioned before called batteries. So uh, when the grid goes down, your home will lose power. And that happens even if you have solar itself. So if you just have solar, uh, there is a common misunderstanding that you'll be able to use the electricity from your solar system uh, when the grid goes down. That's not true if you don't have another piece of technology called battery storage. Uh, having that technology, though, uh, it has a lot of, uh, there's a lot of co-benefits between solar and battery storage. The solar can uh, charge your battery and the battery allows you to use your solar when the grid is down. So it's a great combination. I like to say it's like peanut butter and jelly for energy resilience. And that's that ability to use electricity when the grid goes down. What are we talking about here? Uh, this is just uh, to give you a little uh, visual representation. So maybe some solar panels on the roof. And then on the left here is a battery in the garage. There are different types of outages that you might expect in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, the first note I wanna make here about batteries is that uh, you're going to want to think about what type of outage you're expecting to uh, be able to endure with your battery. The vast majority of outages are caused by things like storms or squirrels chewing on electrical lines. Uh, and those tend to be the uh, more frequent but shorter duration outages, maybe just an hour or a couple of hours. Uh, and those happen uh, typically when you're a little bit farther out from the urban center, you're toward the end of the line on the grid. Uh, you know if you experience frequent outages and uh, if you experience frequent short outages, uh, that's that type of outage I'm talking about here. Additionally, there is another type of power outage called a public safety power shutoff 
This is actually a preventative measure that the utility companies use where they shut off a portion of their grid in order to prevent their infrastructure from sparking a wildfire during red flag uh, conditions when it's really hot, really dry, really windy. This happened for the first time in Oregon in 2020. Uh, it also happened this past year in 2022. Uh, and we may expect that it will happen with a uh, slowly increasing occurrence in Oregon generally. Uh, places like Hood River County uh, and more rural areas may be uh, more uh, prone to the public safety power shutoffs. Finally, we live in the Cascadia seismic zone. And so we're all expecting that at some point in the future, there may be a very large earthquake and uh, different parts of Oregon will be affected differently. But in the central part, the central valley portion of the state and north and south from there, the uh, you may expect that the power could go off for up to six weeks. So that's an entirely different type of outage than these other two that I'm mentioning here. Um, and so just think about this and reflect on what why you're really getting a battery, because that'll be important to communicate that to your installer. When it comes to picking a battery, Solar Oregon is brand agnostic, both with regard to components and with regard to installers. That's not to say that there aren't uh, you know, better and, and worse in either of those categories. Uh, we just don't advocate for any specific brand. Uh, however, there are a large number of options when it comes to battery storage. Uh, there's many different makes and models. There's also different chemistries. Uh, the battery chemistry that is uh, you're going to find in, in the vast majority of products you're looking at if you're finding a battery for your grid-tied home uh, is going to be lithium-ion uh, battery chemistry. There's a couple of different varieties. One of them is uh, nickel mag manganese cobalt. Another is lithium iron phosphate. Uh, these are both great technologies. Uh, they just have uh, some subtle trade-offs in terms of the cost uh, and in terms of the longevity. Uh, your contractor will be able to walk you through that. One thing to note about batteries, though, is if you want to pick between multiple different types of batteries, you might have to get quotes from multiple contractors, which we would recommend either way. Uh, but this is because a contractor may specialize in a specific battery uh, brand. And so maybe they install just that one brand. Typically, there's no mixing and matching between uh, battery brands. Uh, however, you can mix uh, sometimes, depending on the brand, uh, products from the same brand and uh, when it comes to mixing batteries, maybe you're adding multiple batteries. Uh, the typical battery capacity is between nine and 14 kilowatt hours. If that doesn't mean anything to you, you don't have to worry about it. But there are, just to note, there are uh, also some uh, brands that make smaller modules that are somewhere around three kilowatt hours, so about a third of that size, or they make mega size units that are uh, 20 kilowatt hours, which is you know about double that size of the standard size. So. Uh, no mixing and matching of brands, though you can uh, sometimes uh, add the different units from a specific brand. One last note about batteries and picking a battery is that uh, there is uh, there are some things that you may want to power, especially things with motors or some specific appliances, that uh, their energy usage surges right when they turn on. Uh, and it can uh, increase the amount of power they're drawing just for an instant, just for uh, a fraction of a second. Um, however, your battery will have a certain surge capacity. So if you have appliances that uh, have a high surge demand, or if, especially if you're powering motors, just mention that to your contractor. They're going to ask you that anyway. Uh, but you're going to want to choose a battery with an appropriate surge capacity. Now, one thing to note is that one battery typically will not back up your whole home and all the circuits in it for a meaningful amount of time. For this reason, there's something called a partial home backup. You can do a whole home backup. It just typically requires multiple batteries and that can increase the cost. Uh, in contrast, a partial home backup uh, will mean that you are choosing which circuits in your home. So you're going to think of that in terms of the circuit breakers in your electrical panel. 
You're going to pick specific circuits to back up with your battery. The rest of the circuits in your home will lose power when the grid goes down. Uh, these these are both viable options, uh, and it's it's really mostly a matter of the cost of having multiple batteries for the whole home backup. When you get a partial home backup, you will get something called an essential loads panel. So you're actually taking those breakers, the circuit breakers from your electrical panel that you choose to back up with your battery, and your solar installer will move them into a second electrical panel, a smaller one that will be installed right next to your electrical panel uh, called your essential loads panel. Uh, it, uh, that's just how you do it, and you wire up the battery to that essential loads panel. Uh, one note about this is that because uh, there's a bit of labor on the part of electricians, which have relatively expensive labor, um, to move those breakers over, uh, relatively speaking, this adds a little bit of cost, uh, though that does not mean that a partial home backup is going to be uh, as expensive as a whole home backup. Typically, it's, it's less expensive still. Now, when it comes to how you think about this with your contractor, your contractor, when you tell them that you would like a battery, is going to probably ask you two questions that are going to be central to your conversation with them. One is, what needs power? So uh, typical things to back up if you're having a partial home backup are, say, a refrigerator to keep food from spoiling, some lights in common areas like the kitchen, hallways, maybe a bedroom, an office, and uh, possibly some outlets to charge computers, cell phones, so that you can work and communicate and things like that. The other question is, for how long do you want to back those up? Uh, th think back now to the different types of power outages that we uh, you might expect to plan for in Oregon. Uh, and so that might give you some insight into how long uh, you, you would need your battery to be functional. Uh, this is going to be a balance between these two things. And so you may find yourself uh, facing difficult choices. Do I include the television in my partial home backup or not? Uh, maybe I want a space heater that can add a lot of uh, electrical demand to your battery. Um, but it's always going to be a balance between what needs power and for how long. Now, uh, when you install your battery can also impact the efficiency of the design and also therefore the efficiency of the cost of your system. Uh, you can install a battery uh, when at the same time you get solar is a great time to install it. You can also install a battery after you get solar. And this might apply if you uh, have an existing solar system and you're wondering if you can add a battery to it. You can in uh, virtually all cases. There is a difference though, uh, and one of the great things about solar and battery storage is that it's a highly customizable technology. That means that your contractor is going to put a bit of work into designing your system specifically for your needs, which is really great and has a lot of benefits. Um, however, when you're adding a battery to an existing solar system, that means that your, your system has already been designed and the components have been selected to work together as just a solar system. When you add a battery to that, you might have to add extra components as compared to if you were adding the battery when you do your initial system design with your solar at the same time. Uh, this can increase the cost uh, of the battery installation by you know, up to $10,000. Uh, and that's because of extra parts, like uh, perhaps an extra inverter, maybe some extra uh, conduit and connectors there, um, and also extra labor uh, because it's more efficient to have the system installed once instead of uh, breaking things open twice and, and installing a second thing. That being said, these are both great options. It's not to dissuade you from getting a battery if you have an existing solar system, and that can certainly come with uh, a lot of benefits. Uh, just note that it, it uh, if you have a choice, uh, it can be more efficient to install the battery at the same time. Finally, uh, you may have noticed from some of the images in this presentation, especially because the images I've chosen have been uh, of installations with multiple batteries, 
Again, typically you're gonna see uh, one battery, but batteries require some space. And installing the battery, uh, the best place to install it is just like with your solar inverter, it's gonna be right near your breaker panel. Uh, you cannot install batteries in a crawl space or a cupboard or other enclosure like that. You can install batteries outside, uh, and that's a perfectly functional place to install a battery. It can increase the cost a little bit uh, with extra labor and conduit. Um, but uh, they do require some space, and so just note that if you're visualizing on the wall next to your electrical panel, um, that that might be a requirement. Uh, and all of these rules about where you can put batteries or where you can't put them is uh, governed by the August National Electrical Code, uh, which is uh, very well thought out by a, a lot of people who are thinking about protecting you and protecting also firefighters who may need to enter your home in the case of a fire uh, and turn specific electrical components off. Um, but just one extra thing to think about with regard to batteries. That's solar plus battery storage. Let's talk numbers and let's talk about the incentives that are available for you to go solar and storage. I wanna talk about solar incentives uh, mostly here first. There are a couple of great solar incentives that are available to you. Uh, your, the incentives that are available to you, uh, your contractor is going to be intimately familiar with all of these, so don't worry really about missing out. Um, but uh, the your utility company uh, does impact or wh which incentives you have access to. So if you are a customer of Pacific Power or Portland General Electric, you'll have access to both of these. Um, everybody will have access to the solar investment tax credit. Uh, that is a 30%, uh, that's a dollar for dollar tax credit of the value of your system. That's something that you, that's the only incentive that you will likely have to apply for on your own. And that's something you'll apply for when you uh, do your taxes. I'll talk about this more in a second. Uh, there's also a standard solar incentive from Energy Trust of Oregon, which is uh, $500 for both Portland General Electric and Pacific Power customers. Uh, if you are not a customer of either of those utilities, you won't have access to that incentive. Let's take a deeper look here. The investment tax credit. One thing I want you to know is that uh, because this is something that you file for on your taxes, and because it is governed by tax law, you should really only trust a tax professional to tell you what you can claim and how to claim the investment tax credit. I am not a licensed tax professional. Solar Oregon is not a licensed tax professional. Please take uh, everything we say here with that in mind. Also, please note that there are uh, sometimes claims made about the investment tax credit by people in the industry. I think that a lot of those are well-meaning uh, people who are trying to help you out. However, I would say if you have questions or if somebody, somebody tells you something that sounds too good to be true, I would definitely check in with a licensed tax professional. However, here's the basics that I want to present to you right now. So this is a, as I said, 30% dollar for dollar incentive. It's something you apply for uh, specifically on IRS forms 5695, which is pictured here on the left. And also uh, you need to input a value on IRS form 1040 schedule three. Uh, these forms are uh, you know, relatively simple. Um, you can take a look at them, they're online. The uh, solar investment tax credit it applies to both solar and storage. That's something that's new this year because of legislation that happened last year at the federal level. Now batteries are included before it was just solar. Um, and note that you do have to have tax liability to take advantage of this incentive. Uh, it can be claimed over several years though. So if you only have uh, tax liability to cover a portion of it, you'll get more credit the following year when you apply uh, until you've, you've used up your credit. Another incentive that I did not mention before is uh, solar within reach, which is also provided by Energy Trust of, uh, of Oregon. This is an awesome incentive. It is an income-based incentive. Uh, what that means is that PGE and Pacific Power customers uh, 
can get uh, quite a bit of money up to 6,000 for Pacific Power, up to 7,200 for Portland General Electric, uh, depending on the, the size of the system. Um, but they have to meet uh, certain income requirements. Specifically, you have to fall below a specific uh, income threshold. It's a relatively generous income threshold. And so, for example, a family four, if you have less than $112,000, $112,860 of uh, total household income, you'll be able to qualify for this incentive. Uh, and so you can find all of the uh, cutoffs, income cutoffs for different household sizes online. Uh, one of the links that I dropped in the chat earlier, uh, which I'll drop again here in a few slides, uh, has a link to uh, this resource. Great incentive. Another incentive that is only available right now for folks who uh, fall below, again, an income threshold, and this is a different income threshold from Solar Within Reach, slightly lower income threshold. Um, this is offered by Oregon Department of Energy, and this is the Solar Plus Storage Rebate. Uh, this was available previously for uh, anybody. It was not income uh, restricted. However, the uh, only money that's available that's left is in the income restricted uh, bucket of funding. The incentive is up to $5,000 for solar and up to an additional $2,500 for battery storage. One thing that's really important to note is your battery must be installed at the same time as your solar system. If you're adding a battery later on, you won't be able to take advantage of this incentive, even if you are income qualified. Now, we're about to jump into the example budgets. I'm excited to walk you through those slides. Uh, I want to quickly review reasons why costs can vary for both solar and battery storage, uh, because the, the example budgets that I'm going to show you, uh, you should take with a grain of salt. They're for a specific system size, and they make a lot of assumptions about uh, your site. So uh, the cost of your solar system you may find uh, could be different, perhaps even dramatically different from the budget I'm about to show you. That being said, uh, so solar reasons, uh, solar system uh, costs can vary. Remember, it's your size of your system can vary dramatically. Maybe you need to re-roof before you go solar. That can add a lot of extra cost. Maybe uh, you live in Portland and you have to have your structural analysis or your reinforcement of your roof. Also, uh, because of variable access to incentives, solar can vary in cost. With battery storage, uh, you uh, your battery system may vary in cost based on whether you're installing your battery to an existing solar system, which might be a little bit more expensive, or whether you're integrating with your solar at the initial installation phase, uh, whether you have one battery or multiple batteries and how many of those batteries you have. Uh, again, with for partial home backups, the essential loads panel, uh, is uh, factors in there. Um, and maybe your battery is installed far away from your electrical panel, maybe on the side of your home as pictured here. And access to the incentives, uh, especially the income-based incentives. So those are reasons why you should take this with a grain of salt. But now let's jump into this example budget. I have three example budgets for you. First, I'm going to walk you through an example budget for solar. Then on the next slide, we'll walk through an example budget for solar and battery, which are installed at the same time. And then finally, we'll walk through a budget example for solar plus uh, a battery being added later after the solar is installed. You'll note that we have four columns here uh, for your utility. I'm showing for this uh, example budget for customers of Pacific Power and Portland General Electric. Uh, and then also where it says LMI, uh, that's short for uh, low or moderate income. And that means that you, we're assuming that you have access to both of the income-based incentives and that you're a Pacific Power customer or for PGE, uh, you have access to those in, in, uh, income-based incentives and you're a PGE customer. Now let's take a look at the leftmost column here. Uh, you'll see the system details. This is your average eight kilowatt solar system. We're going to assume for all of these cases that the total eligible project cost is $32,000 for this installation. Uh, the 
First, we're going to add the Energy Trust of Oregon incentive, which is going to be $500 for uh, both Pacific Power and Portland General Electric customers. Or if you have access to solar within reach, that's that large income-based incentive, it's going to be uh, either $6,000 or $7,200. So quite a big difference there. Uh, then we'll arrive at the net cost. You can see that being subtracted. Uh, then we're going to also add in here the state rebate. It will be not available for folks who are not income uh, qualified. However, for income qualified folks, uh, you should be able to max out that incentive for an eight kilowatt solar system at $5,000. That leads us to our out-of-pocket customer cost. Uh, let's just walk through these numbers here so we don't get left behind. Uh, for Pacific Power or Portland General Electric, it's going to be 31,500, so roughly the same cost as before these first two incentives. Um, or for Pacific Power customers, uh, around $20,000, or PGE, again, probably around $20,000. This is the out-of-pocket co cost that you will pay as a customer. Uh, these incentives that we just subtracted to get to this out-of-pocket cost, your installer will apply for on your behalf, they'll receive on your behalf, and they'll pass those savings on to you. Uh, so you don't even have to do any of the paperwork, which is one of the, the great things. So uh, this is what you'll sign in your contract and pay out of pocket. Uh, the 30% federal tax credit uh, is something that you're, you'll be able to claim uh, then when you do taxes the following spring. And uh, if you have enough tax liability, you'll be able to claim all this at once, or you might claim it over several years. But uh, here's the values in these four cases. Um, the final cost to you after the tax credit is going to be either around $22,000 in this case, or around thirteen dollars or $14,000 if you are income qualified. So you can see that the incentives do vary, and they also uh, make a big impact on your solar system cost. Now let's go ahead and walk through your solar plus storage uh, system cost. Um, again, installing at the same time, same eight kilowatt solar system. Uh, and here we're adding on a 10 kilowatt hour battery. We're gonna assume a total eligible project cost of $44,000. You can see I've added up all the solar incentives together here and it's gonna be, uh, different for income-based versus non-income-based, just as before. The battery incentives, we're going to max out the $2,500 for income-based uh, customers, and it's going to be zero otherwise. Therefore, your out-of-pocket cost to the customer is going to be uh, either around $43,500 here or around $30,000. After you take the federal tax credit, it's going to come to a net uh, cost to, to you, to the customer, of around $30,000 or around $20,000. Finally, let's take a look at what happens uh, if you add the battery after solar. I'm not going to walk through uh, everything here, um, but we have the cost of the solar, which is separate from the cost of the battery. And uh, we're making some assumptions here about the complexity of, of uh, your system. Uh, but again, here, uh, the, uh, you're not gonna have any battery incentives from the state, uh, here. So that's the, the main difference here, uh, in addition to the additional cost in the cost of the battery. Uh, let's skip ahead, uh, to after the tax credit, you can see that this is going to be, uh, roughly 38,000 or 30,000, as opposed to, uh, in the previous slide, 30,000 versus 20,000. Uh, for income, non-income versus income qualified customers. I hope this information is useful to you. Uh, this is the first time we're presenting all three of these budgets. I'd love to hear feedback about uh, whether this is, uh, which, which information is most useful to you here. Um, but again, remember that, uh, take this with a grain of salt. One final note here about the cost of solar is that uh, because the upfront cost can be substantial, for solar and battery storage. Financing is not uncommon. Your solar contractor may partner with a credit union or a bank or another third-party provider of a financing product. And some of these financing products may be tailored to solar. Uh, and that can be a good thing. Um, uh, one common uh, way that looks is that uh, you're able to 
uh, when you file for your tax credit and you get that money back, you're able to pay off a big portion of the loan and then refinance and get a lower interest rate, uh, which can be a plus. You can also find financing through a bank uh, that you have an existing relationship with. So that might most commonly be a bank that you have your mortgage with. Uh, that's a good place to ask and just ask them what uh, products they might offer for solar for you. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, is just, uh, I would treat like any major financial decision, make sure that you're, uh, you're understanding what the financing product is that you're purchasing uh, and that you've uh, found uh, good options and that you've assessed your options thoroughly. But then financing can uh, take away that upfront cost. And uh, in some cases, uh, your monthly payments on your uh, solar loan can be roughly the cost of a gym membership, um, sometimes even less. And so uh, that is a great benefit of financing. Of course, you do have to pay the interest then on the loan itself. That's some information about the cost of solar. Let's jump into our last section. Uh, I know we're running a little over time. I believe this is because some of the additional content we have today. So I'm gonna go through this in a few minutes here and then I'll be happy to stay on the line uh, and go through all the Q and A questions that we have. Um, so how do you choose a contractor? Well, in Oregon, uh, we have a great program provided by Energy Trust of Oregon where they rigorously qualify solar contractors and vet them for you uh, and rank them, uh, rate them. And uh, this is called the Energy Trust Trade Ally uh, Program. So contractors will either be trade allies of Energy Trust uh, or they won't. Uh, I would highly recommend that you consider a trade ally for your system. This is for a number of reasons, not just because they're uh, qualified uh, contractors, but uh, also because they're the only contractors who can access the Energy Energy Trust of Oregon incentives. So that includes the solar within reach incentive as well as the standard solar incentive. There is an awesome tool that is provided by Energy Trust of Oregon uh, called the Solar Bid tool, which is on their website. It takes about three to five minutes to fill out. You uh, give basic information about your site, your address, what you're looking for. They will take that information and uh, randomly select three highly rated trade ally contractors who serve your area. And they'll all get in touch with you and offer you a free uh, quote for solar or solar and storage. I'm gonna go ahead and drop the links back in the chat for everybody. You'll see the link that says energy, energy trust dash solar bid tool. That's the link to this tool. And if you were gonna save one piece of information uh, from this webinar, I would say save that link. It's just really handy. Uh, and this is a great way to find multiple contractors. I would highly recommend getting quotes from multiple contractors uh, for your solar system so you can compare them. Finally, your installation uh, is a turnkey service. So what that means is your contractor, they'll uh, get in touch with you, they'll provide you with a, a site survey potentially, or they'll be able to provide you with uh, a quote just uh, using um, uh, information gathered remotely. Either way, you sign your contract, and after that, your contractor handles all aspects of your installation, going from the initial system design, uh, the uh, getting your local uh, permits, your structural and electrical permits. Uh, then they will get you on your uh, their construction calendar. They'll do the installation. Uh, then they will handle all of the uh, uh, closing out the permits and the inspection by the the local jurisdiction. They'll also swap out your get, arrange for your utility to swap out your electrical meter to get a new bi-directional meter and they'll arrange for your utility to uh, perform interconnection with your device. Uh, and finally, they'll turn your system on so it starts to power the grid. Um, so they do quite a bit. They also apply for some incentives for you and receive those for you. So uh, what you can expect after you sign your contract is there's a period of time where they're doing the initial system design, the permitting, uh, and getting your incentives that may take between two and in some cases where there is some lags in the market, 
even up to about 12 months. That's especially true in places that with slow building departments like Portland. Um, so there's a range there of how long you might have to wait. While you're waiting though, nothing has happened to your home. So it's not an inconvenience to you. Uh, once the installation occurs, that's typically done in one to two days. And so it's relatively pain-free. Uh, and then there's another couple of weeks for the interconnection and the power on of your system. Once it's powered on, uh, you're producing clean renewable energy with your solar system. And uh, it, I've heard, feels great. So that is our How to Go Solar and Storage uh, webinar. Uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us. I am excited to dip into this Q&A and answer all of your questions. Uh, I would also like to make a couple quick notes. Uh, one is first, I'm gonna launch a post-event survey. Um, your feedback here on how well uh, this was delivered is really useful to us to figure out what we're doing well and what we're not. Um, and also there's a couple questions about times uh, of events that you prefer. Uh, so appreciate your feedback there. I'm going to leave that up throughout the Q&A, so don't feel rushed on it. Uh, this has been recorded. You are going to be provided with the link to the recording on the Solar Oregon YouTube as soon as I get that up there, probably in the next day or so. Uh, and feel free to reach out. My email is in the chat. Uh, it's the bottom link there, uh, Zach S at solaroregon.org. Uh, love to uh, talk to all of you and help you along with your solar storage journey, that's what we're here to do. So uh, let's, thanks for joining and let's jump into this q and It looks like we have a lot of questions. Okay, my heart stopped for a second because I saw one that said, uh, I do not hear your sound, but the next one says, got the sound now. So that's, that's good to hear that I, I delivered this presentation with sound. Uh, all right. Uh, Tomoko, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, asks, is there a way of copying or saving the links in the chat? Yeah, you should be able to uh, open up the chat and then uh, just mouse over and select them all. Uh, and then you can copy them into a document there. Uh, I can also include those in the follow-up email from this event, if that's useful. Uh, Ron asks, what types of connectors do microinverters have? And if one connection comes apart, do we lose the solar system? Uh, in other words, is it series connected for folks who have a little bit of an electrical background? Uh, that's a good question. So there is a specific type of connector uh, and I'm not sure of the uh, technical jargon name for it, uh, but you'll see that for, uh, it's the, the leads that are on the end of, of every solar panel are exactly the same so that all of the inverter technologies have the same standard plug. So you won't have to worry about compatibility. If you have microinverters that are built for solar, they'll be able to plug into your solar system there. Uh, in terms of whether, uh, say in for some reason, uh, those, those connections are secure. I've never heard of a microinverter coming unplugged from a solar panel, but if that were to happen, uh, the great news is that uh, your, the, red, the, the panels that are being uh, serviced by that microinverter, which will be one or two panels, may lose power. Uh, you'll be able to see that on your monitoring, and then hopefully your contractor will come and uh, fix that for you. Uh, however, the, uh, the rest of your panels on your system will not lose power because these are not in series, they're in parallel, essentially. That's the great news about uh, that. Um, Julie asks, is the uh, credit retail price? So I think what's being asked here, and feel free to correct me, Julie, if I'm wrong, but I think that what's being asked here is that uh, the tax credit, the federal tax credit, uh, is what you are claiming on the tax credit, the retail price, so the price that you sign for the total system installation cost for your solar and or battery storage system. And the uh, again, I just wanna say that uh, I'm not a licensed tax professional, so please take everything I say about the, and everything anybody who's not a licensed tax professional says with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, typically that is the case. Uh, yes, it's the amount that is shown on your uh, solar contract. 
However, if you have questions, if it comes to uh, things regarding uh, the structural reinforcement, if that applies to your project, you can always ask a tax professional. Uh, we've got another question here. If your roof is 20 years old with composite shingles rated at 40 years, uh, do you need to replace the roof prior to solar installation? That's a great question. So uh, the my tentative answer is that if you have 20 years of life left on your system, that should be, uh, I would say that's good uh, for solar. The um, minimum in order to receive the Energy Trust of Oregon incentive is 10 years, but again, 20 years really is best. Um, if you uh, have a 40-year-old roof, a roof that is rated at 40 years, the one thing is that that that's the rating of the roof, and uh, it may be that your roof, depending on where it was installed uh, or uh, your cover, uh, what's around your roof, what's, what's going on, the elements it's exposed to, uh, it may be aging quicker or slower than intended by the manufacturer. Uh, so it can never hurt to just have your solar installer get up on your roof and kick their boot toes against it and see uh, what kind of condition it's in um, and just get that verification. But it sounds like you're probably in a decent situation. Uh, I'm going to skip these up because it looks like uh, we've got them in uh, cl clumped together by the asker. So I'm going to skip forward to Scott here. Scott asks, battery will be will continue to recharge when the grid is down, correct? Um, good question. So uh, your battery can charge from the grid or it can charge from solar, depending on the mode in which your battery uh, is operating. And so uh, one thing I didn't mention is that your uh, battery, typically, depending on the make of the model, will have several modes of operation. One is that uh, it's always ready for, uh, it's just trying to stay as fully charged as possible all the time, waiting for the outage for you. Another mode is uh, that you want to use your solar energy and keep that in your battery. And then, so it will fill up during the day and then discharge in the evening. Uh, you can still typically in that mode, uh, get some, some pr decent protection during most times for a grid outage, but it's a different mode of operation. Um, in the, uh, usually a smartphone app or on your computer desktop, you'll have the ability to toggle through these different modes. Uh, and you'll be able to see if your system is charging at any given moment from your solar or from your uh, utility grid. And if you are in the mode to charge only from solar, you will only be charging from solar. Um, regardless, your uh when the grid is down, you can't charge from the grid. However, you can still charge from your solar system uh, if you have your system tied to solar. So hopefully that answers your question and wasn't uh, too much extra info. Vaughn asks, what is the potential monthly output for a eight kilowatt solar system? It's a great question. So um, the... Uh, System sizes, so eight kilowatt, that is the nameplate rating of the solar system. Kilowatts and kilowatt hours get confusing. It takes a little while uh, if uh, you uh, are new to electricity to wrap your head around to it, uh, around it, but um, but it's the nameplate rating. Eight kilowatts doesn't mean it's producing eight kilowatts at any given moment. Uh, it doesn't mean that that's, it's your system's going to produce a certain amount of electricity over any given period of time. Uh, it's just saying how much potential your system has to produce energy, essentially. So uh, it's a little complex, a little wonky. Don't worry too much about it. Um, but the uh, monthly output from your system will vary depending on the cloud cover, the climatic conditions, how those vary and change over time. So from month to month and year to year, you might see small variations. Uh, that being said, it's relatively easy for solar contractors to predict how much energy your system is going to produce. Uh, they're pretty good at it. Uh, it doesn't mean that's how much you're going to produce each year. Uh, in terms, to get to the answer to your question, what is the potential monthly output for an eight uh, kilowatt solar system? I would say uh, that that is...
roughly around 80 or 90. I could be wrong here. I roughly, if I'm doing the, the math in my head, roughly around 80 or 90 kilowatt hours. De again, depending on the roof orientation uh, and the sunlight you're receiving, all sorts of things like that. Uh, Rod asks, absolutely the, the best meeting on getting started with solar and battery storage. Thank you. Uh, I learned so much by attending. I would be interested in attending more Zoom like this. Similar to, uh, it's not a question, but a compliment. I very appreciate it, Rod. Thank you. Um, and Rod, uh, I see you have another question here, so I'll just skip to that. Uh, oh, no, it's another compliment. Thank you. <laughs> much appreciated. Um, all right, let's jump back up here to uh, Ron. So if someone has a shaded house but wants to offset uh, their power bill with solar, are there companies uh, of shared users that one can buy into for their equivalent of eight kilowatt hours? Um, yes, there are a couple of options for you. And it's a great question. Uh, not the topic of our webinar, but that doesn't mean that it isn't something you could consider, especially if your roof is shaded, or even if you uh, don't own your roof, say you're renting or something like that. Uh, though it sounds like in this case, you're wondering about uh, pro property you own. Um, either way, there are two options. One of them is community solar. And this is a, a program that is uh, run by the state of Oregon. Basically, a developer will build a solar farm somewhere out in the countryside. It could be big. Maybe it's a small one on the side of a church. Either way, you as a customer of your utility, if you are a PGE or Pacific Power customer, uh, and there is a system on your utility grid that you want to subscribe to, you can subscribe to it. And instead of paying for the electricity that you consume, you'll essentially swap that out with uh, energy generated virtually from this community solar system. Uh, it's a great way to support solar and to power your home with clean energy, even though it's virtually. Um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's something else there, but that, that it's, it's just a great option for that. There's another option, uh, which is provided by a organization called the Oregon Clean Power Co-op, and they have what they call co-op solar, which is very similar, but it's, it's instead of uh, subscribing uh, and through your utility, what you would do is um, essentially buy into a solar project as though it were stock, uh, and then you will get some of the energy in terms of the financial benefit from the energy that is produced, and that offsets your uh, electrical consumption on your site. That's Oregon Clean Power Co-op. The other option was uh, Oregon Community Solar Program, um, and uh, you can check those out. Uh, Oregon Community Solar Program is uh, OCS, Oregon CSP dot, uh, com, I believe. Uh, and Oregon Clean Power Co-op is uh, OregonCleanPower.coop. All right, let's uh, switch back to Scott here. Scott says, is it practical to have a solar panel installation done in such a way that it's battery ready, uh, storage ready for future install and still gain some cost savings? That's a great question. Uh, there are uh, some specifications offered by uh, different uh, entities, uh, for example, they can be enshrined in building code, or they could just be offered as a specification by a, uh, an organization that offers specifications for things that are storage ready, or also similar thing is solar ready. Um, for example, Oregon has, uh, some solar ready codes. Um, the best source for this, I would say is energy trust of Oregon. Uh, they have a uh, storage ready specification. I believe uh, I believe they're in the process of updating that. So it may be updated here soon. Um, regardless, that is something that your installer can follow. It's not code so that it's not something that they're required to follow with your solar system. But if your installer is able to work with that specification, uh, that is something that can decrease the cost of adding a battery later on. However, I don't have experience, uh, enough experience to be able to say exactly how much that could decrease the cost. Your contractor may be able to speak to that a little bit, <laughs> but I would say uh, regardless, you can mention the Energy Trust 
storage ready specification to them and see what they think. Vaughn asks, what is the life expectancy of a solar system? That's a great question. Uh, solar, uh, the best answer, the, the most direct answer, I think getting at, at what you're wanting to get here is uh, the warranty terms for solar typically. So there are sometimes a couple of different warranties that you'll receive. One is on the solar panels themselves, which typically is for 25 years. Uh, that's the warranty lifetime of the solar panels. In terms of the actual lifetime of the solar panels, uh, sometimes solar panels uh, that were produced all the way back, the first ones uh, produced, some of those are still around. It's uh, It depends, and uh, I can't guarantee the lifetime, and solar uh, is a new, it's, it's no longer really a new technology. It's been around, uh, and the industry has grown a lot of the, over the last 10 years, but we don't have the bulk of data, I would say, uh, to really guarantee what the lifetime is of your solar panel. Uh, but the fact that it's warranted for 25 years means you don't have to worry about it. Uh, your inverter is typically uh, warranted for 25 years if you get an extended warranty. Some of the standard warranties for inverters are 10 years. I would highly recommend that you get the extended warranty. It doesn't cost too much, and you get that extra 15 years of protection for your inverter. The reason I'd recommend that is because if one of the components is going to fail on your system, uh, all of these components are uh, high quality, uh, the ones on the market. Um, but between the inverter and the solar panels, the inverter is most likely going to be the component that uh, would fail first. So uh, get that extended warranty and you're, you're golden. Uh, sometimes also you'll have a warranty offered by your contractor for the workmanship. Uh, and you may also get a production guarantee from your contractor in some cases. Uh, and uh, that's just saying, you know, we guarantee that your system will produce 95% of what we estimate that it will produce for you. Uh, and if it doesn't, we'll make up the cost there. The terms can vary slightly, but that's the gist of a production guarantee. Uh, and those are the mechanisms that uh, take the risk uh, away uh, from you. Uh, ask your contractor, the contractors you're considering, about the terms of their warranties and what they offer but that's the gist of it. Back up here to uh, Ron. Ron asks, how heavy is a typical solar panel, one panel? That is a great question. I believe the typical weight, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, is 30 or 35 pounds. Uh, and that's a number I'm remembering, and I'm remembering carrying them last time I carried them. Um, I believe that's the weight of a typical solar panel. Scott asks, seems like uh, if one is low income, it will take many years to uh, avail of the federal tax credit because the tax liability is low. Uh, yeah, it could be that um, you will, uh, if, if uh, you are income qualified, uh, then you may also have a lower tax liability. Um, and that is, uh, means that you won't get all that benefit right up front necessarily. Uh, so if that factors in, uh, then, uh, that may be something you want to consider. Uh, Ron asks, can you mix and match panels if one fails and you have to buy a replacement and you can't locate your brand? Are connectors the same or are panels simply hardwired? This is a great question. Uh, the size of panels and the connections are uh, standardized and for a, a lot of the uh, for the, the, the products that you'll be considering on the market. Um, so in terms of the uh, physical possibility of swapping out one brand of panel for another and mixing and matching like that, um, it is possible. The one question I would ask my contractor if you were considering doing that is whether it would void the warranty of any of the components in your solar system. And I don't know that it would, but that uh, if I were to suspect any issue you might uh, run into there, it would be that one. Uh, and they can check in that warranty uh, for your panels and for your inverter uh, and your battery and get back to you on that. But um, 
There may or may not be rules about that, but uh, never hurts to check. Scott asks, uh, the cost table you showed contradict your answer about tax credit. The table shows 30% being applied out of the out-of-pocket cost. Um, ah, okay, so that's, Scott, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I think that's probably uh, something I worded incorrectly. The table is uh, correct. Uh, it is the out-of-pocket cost, and that's because the tax credit uh, does not apply to the incentives you receive from Energy Trust of Oregon or from the uh, Oregon Department of Energy solar plus storage rebate. And so uh, the out-of-pocket cost uh, is what is uh, you're going to sign for on your contract. And so, um, so what I said about what you sign for on your contract is typically the what you will claim for the tax credit. Again, ask a tax professional if you have any questions. Um, but, uh, but it, it will not, you cannot claim uh, the, uh, value of the system that is covered by other incentives, which is a great clarifying point. Uh, and finally, our last question here, a lot, a lot of great questions, guys. So thanks so much, uh, for, uh, being a, an interactive audience. Uh, Ron asks, do you, do solar systems have approval? markings from an accredited organization like UL? Is that required in most uh, jurisdictions? Yes, uh, the, all of the components that uh, uh, solar, the inverter, batteries are gonna be UL listed uh, and uh, all the ones that you have that are common in the market, uh, any trade ally contractor, that's uh, they're going to use UL listed components. Uh, and so that's going to be, uh, of course, uh, that's a layer for folks who are not familiar with UL. Uh, that's um, a, uh, a form of standardization for electrical uh, components, I believe just electrical components. Uh, and uh, it's just a, another layer of protection. It's like a, uh, a code for manufactured products in particular. So... Awesome questions. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close things out now, and then I will get to you soon with a link to this recording and the links from the chat. Uh, please uh, come to our future events. Again, we have the February 4th event, and we also have uh, our showcase in East Portland on uh, next Tuesday, one week from tonight at 5 p.m. I hope to see you there. All right. Thanks so much.